Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Check-ins. Uh, I have uh, excited nervousness right now, and I am drinking Mexican beer. It's a true story. I only drink Mexican beer at the Dark Stoa. So welcome to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge. And today we have the most dangerous man on the internet, some say, um, Pat Ryan. Um, and Pat has been having, if this is your first time here at the, the Stoa or the Dark Stoa, which is what we're calling Pat Ryan series, Pat has been having an ongoing um, kind of exploration of his thought. And, um, you know, we're just basically encouraging him to talk about whatever the fuck he wants to talk about uh, with an act of trust that he does not get the Stoa canceled or suicided. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, so how today's going to work is uh, Pat's going to share his thoughts. And um, after that, we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions for Pat, write in the chat box. I will unmute you. Uh, and then you ask Pat your, your question. If you want me to ask uh, your question on your behalf, just uh, indicate that in the chat box. This will go on YouTube, um, just FYI. So that being said, I will uh, unmute Pat and give you co-host access. So the floor is yours, my friend. Excellent. Thank you again for the platform. I do appreciate it. I've been deplatformed more times than I've been platformed. So I'm, in, I'm enjoying the what is most likely limited time I have here. Um, so thank you all for coming back. We are approaching the end of what I would call a season of the topics that we've been kind of swirling around. Everything is actually connected when you put all these chains together. And these next three episodes are definitely going to cohere and bring it all together. Kind of like Ikea furniture when you get to like the last couple steps and it all locks into place. So um, last week we talked about blackmail inflation which was the exploration of what it means to take zero trust networks that rely on mutual blackmail and then destroy the underlying blackmail material that keeps those trust networks together. And the way to destroy them is to use uh, deep fakes to explode the volume of it and thus inflate it the same way you would inflate gold by printing too much certificates of deposit against it. That opened up what we would call the Tartarus scenario, where all of these mutually blackmailed but powerful people are suddenly decoupled from one another. That can spell certain disaster. So I've been doing doom porn for the past two episodes. Now it's time to look at some of the solutions that are possible um, and at least trending towards these directions. So the first one is I'm going to take some parlance from Jordan Green Greenhall. I I'm not sure if he came up with game A, game B, but he's certainly heavy in that community. So this particular episode is going to look into what's called game A's most likely outcome in the Tartarus scenario. And what we're, and that's going to be called robotic nationalism. So with that said, um, let's get this funny show started. I think that's the correct one. And also I believe I fixed my audio. So I should have a much better quality audio this time around. I'm really excited about that. Okay, making sure I share just this screen. Uh, sorry, one moment, let me confirm. So, mistake on my part, and I apologize. Let's see, that's right, yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, and we're back. Okay, robotic nationalism, game A. Um, it kind of looks like this, but it really doesn't. I'm just, you know, just grabbing some stuff for visualization purposes. Don't forget that wonderful little VPN. Um, that might be relevant later on in the slide. So robotic nationalism is going to explore what we all know as the military industrial complex, which is a pile of scary words and ooh, ooh, that's big, which is usually a pile of scary words and everyone has their own personal opinion of what it is, but we're not going to look into personal opinions. We're going to look into the key functions of why it keeps happening, um, the core behind all of it the problems it's actually solving, because it is solving a specific problem, it's not all greed, and how it's likely to extend in a world of cheap robotics and AI. 
So to get started, I always like to start with the fundamentals, as you know. So we're going to start with war. Well, first, we're going to start with the Totara scenario. So this is a recap uh, of the end of the previous episode where we have our run-of-the-mill, unaccountable, psychopathic billionaire living in his own self-curating moral universe. It's a, it sounds like a, a title for a My Chemical Romance song. But these are all the toys and tools that he has available uh, to basically do whatever he wants and use force of will to justify whatever it is he's doing. So in this episode, we're going to focus on the robot army. Because we know how the nukes go and smart dust, it's, it's chemtrails. I don't want to go there yet. Uh, C CRISPR we've already done. Robot army is up next. So, oh yeah, this VPN is like really powerful. So, okay, we're going to go into the history of war. <clears throat> which is everyone's not favorite topic. And again, everyone has a billion opinions about it. So I'm going to stick to timelines and objects and concepts. And I'm going to use this wonderful little Zoomer meme that's been going around the internet uh, that comes with the Federal Reserve printing too much money. So I'm just going to steal that. So we're going to start with the, the Kush versus the Hyksos. I don't know how to pronounce that, which means I read for a living. Um, the chariot was a devastating weapon when it got introduced. You... It's, it's, it seems like such a simple concept. You're like, it's wheels and a, you know, a poor cart and two horses just strapped to it. And you're up against people on foot. You can just run donuts around them all day and just arrow, 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 arrow. And there's nothing you could do. You're just screwed. Um, and these armies were not full of like extreme IQ trained professional soldiers. These were like farmers who had never seen these type of things before. So especially during the Kush and the Hyksospores, um, these were heavily deployed and the backbone of a lot of Egyptian military prowess for, th for thousands of years. Uh, most of the Eastern Mediterranean their military corps were surrounded by supporting their chariot forces for, for a very long time. So this was a devastating, like super asymmetrical advantage over your regional enemies, probably up until the Bronze Age collapse. Which then leads, of course, when you have all of these type of Mediterranean powers fighting one another, they obviously have the resources and the networks and the wealth to command these massive armies. So during the Bronze Age collapse, you have all these problems. Um, the the proto is the proto Judea Empire collapses. Egypt doesn't collapse, but it gets set back so far to this day it still hasn't recovered. You have the proto Turkey Empire is collapsing, and um, the proto Syrian Empire is collapsing. Um, and during that that collapsing effort, people basically run more inland, and they start setting up these empires, things like. Uh, not necessarily Babylon, but uh, Darius and, and Persia and that type of legacy comes in with the Sansirkins, whose, again, last name I can't pronounce. Um, but the Persian Empire becomes a massive player as a result of these type of consolidations and reconfigurations of power. And this is massively challenged at the presence of, of Alexander the Great. He, after years of being trained by Aristotle, has this ambition to, one, try to see the rest of the world. <laughs> actually, he wants to see if there's an ocean on the other side of the planet. Like that's actually a serious motivation for Alexander the Great. He wants to see if, if like the Pacific Ocean is real or not, which is ridiculous. Like I'm going to hire some of the world's most ridiculous armies just so I can see an ocean, like, I, I, mean, I guess. Um, but these are the stabby squares of, of, uh, of Alexander the Great. And I believe when they intercepted Darius and took his gold cart, it was the equivalent of $3 billion in gold in today's value. So that gold injection, which was the accumulated gold of, of, of Babylon and Egypt and all these other players, it, Alexander basically said, yoink, and just threw that into Europe. Um, without that move, you would not have Europe as a power force today. This move alone changed everything all of it. We would have been a, like, we as in white people who are white people here at least, uh, we white people would have been a backwater for all of time had Alexander not done this. By basically stealing all of the gold from antiquity, um, the rest of the world was forced to deal with Europe as a trade partner at the very minimum instead of just an endless source of slaves and, you know, these, these strange light-skinned people. So that's, again, war changing the world, uh, whether we like it or not. Of course, that gold injection powers a lot of the Grecian empires, which then in turn leads to the robustness of, 
of European economy, which of course leads to Rome being able to form its unique republic, uh, expanding outward and outward up until you get to, I can never pronounce this guy's name, but that's not important. This is just a, a fun little example of, of Julius Caesar, which I always thought was a really good statue of him. Julius Caesar demonstrating a brilliance of logistics more so than direct muscle. He's not out there stabbing people, be like, I'm the biggest soldier. He was able to command wartime engineering, building bridges uh, on the fly using immediate local resources and the expertise he dragged with him to cross streams of water and move his entire supply chain across it. In this particular fight, um, Alias, I believe it was Battle of Alias. I can't remember the name. Um, this particular fight, he was severely at a disadvantage and he basically surrounded this guy's forces and his cities with two gigantic walls and starved them out. Um, and it worked. Uh, so this was, this is one of those examples where planning logistics, foresight and insight, uh, changed the nature of war itself. It became less about bravery and heroism and more about really thinking many, many moves down the line. Uh, the brilliance of this play led of course to the um, the formation of, of Imperial Rome when he would then cross the Rubicon and, and basically end the, begin the ending of the Republic and, and bring the Imperial Rome into play, which would then resolve into the bifurcation of Rome, which is Western, Europe, or Western Rome and Eastern Rome, uh, where you have Rome proper as the capital and then Constantinople way off in, in the borderlands of Turkey. Which of course leads us to the wonderful Crusades, which is one of those misunderstood periods of war. Or history. It's often seen as like, oh, this is just religious intolerance and bigotry and blah, blah, blah. Eh, not really. Um, more than anything, you had a surplus male population in Europe at the time. You got to dump that hormone somewhere, man. That's a, you don't want surplus testosterone in your fields. Yeah, the Vikings were maybe 300 years before this stuff started. You got to put them somewhere. But more importantly, um, they wanted to protect Constantinople. The, the Pope at the time, he saw a chance to unify Rome after the bifurcation. And he said, okay, well, let's bring some Western European forces in to the protection of Constantinople, but we're not just going to post soldiers at the gates. We're going to set up buffer states beyond Constantinople. So all the way down to Jerusalem and, and every country in between. And that, those buffer states are going to absorb and slow down attacks against Constantinople. Because at this time, the, um, the, uh, not the, they weren't Ottomans per se, but the proto-Ottomans, uh, they were a significant fighting force, very powerful. They were able to command the, uh, the wealth of the Silk Road to their advantage considerably. They were, not, they were not just a bunch of like backwaters. These were brilliant, intelligent logistics people themselves. Um, and for 400 years, I think the Crusades kicked off. Uh, and Constantinople was inevitably sacked by these forces, uh, by... Um, by like a dynasty who was just obsessed with sacking Constantinople. Like he had visions of it, like, like divine premonitions of sacking Constantinople. And, oh, it's Microsoft Mehmed. He has opinions. He <laughs> looks like you refer to my city as Constantinople. Um, this is the guy who eventually took it. And the way he took it was with cannons, big cannons, like big cannons, 1500s bronze that would shoot a... 100 pound rock one mile that type of cannery i mean these things are so, like the cannoneers were deaf after the first round so you just had a bunch of deaf people just shooting this stuff and uh <laughs> to really just drive home with this guy's seriousness and taking constantinople not only was he just hammering the walls which were like legendary walls um he with these cannons there was also like this like 700 meter chain in the harbor and boats could not pass through it. So you couldn't send a naval force to actually attack Constantinople. So what this guy did is he took his entire Navy and he just put it on log rollers and moved it around the land to the opposite side of the chain. That's, the, that's, like, that's like dedication, right? This guy did it. He took Constantinople, turned it into Istanbul. And by controlling that, uh, he basically controlled all of the Silk Road demand of Europe into Europe. So it was like this hotbed node like this really powerful trade hub. And so he owned European demand. So you couldn't get silk, pepper, nothing. You couldn't get anything unless you paid this guy. This of course leads to the age of sail where the Europeans say, fuck that, not paying that guy. It's actually better for me to sail around Africa than pay that guy. 
And so you had this huge incentive to start exploring these ships that can do all of this trade. And this was, again, the brilliance of, of Mehmed to ship his ships through that little piece of land. Well, the Europeans said, we'll ship our ships all across the planet instead. Thank you very much. We'll set up a secondary plan for all of our spice trade instead. Um, this kind of pivots outside of the very interesting intricacies of this cat and mouse access to the Silk Road stuff. The advent of the musket is kind of self, it's obvious. Um, I think in the 1300s, the Pope banned the crossbow because it was able to allow peasants to completely dismantle his heavy cavalry. And heavy cavalry was super expensive. You had the armor of the person, trained the person, you had the armor of the horse. I don't know if you ever armored a horse before, but that's pretty expensive stuff. And uh, one crossbow just, poof, just go right through the armor and that was it. So, I mean, it was like the AK-47 of its time and Pope banned it forever. But they tried to ban muskets and it didn't go so well. These were getting easier to produce, mostly because of the sacking of Constantinople. Turkish mastery of um, gunpowder and cannonry was starting to be embraced by the rest of Europe uh, afterwards. They got their asses handed to them and they started to adapt pretty quick. So the musketry, not really exactly accurate. It's just a ball and a smooth bore. So it's just like, you know, the ball is going down the bore and then maybe it goes, you know, it's like, it's like Schrodinger's musket, where does it go? So to, the, the, to counter that, you just line up like 10, 20 people and you hope for the best. You know, you have, a, you have 20 chances to probably hit your targets, um, which is why we look at square formations and think that's insane, but that's, that's, how you, that's how you accounted for the inaccuracy of these initial weapons. And these things were just tearing through armor. So we're probably in around the mid 1500s at this point, just chewing through armor. And uh, so again, really expensive investment. Uh, it's a sign of culture. It's a sign of royalty, heredity. Uh, and these things were just, you know, angry proto-Republicans. And I don't mean that in the American sense. I mean that in the European sense, the Republican revolutions of the 1600s. Um, these guys uh, were just happy to overthrow royalty left, right, and center using their newfound toy. And uh, speaking of newfound toys, uh, you start using guns long enough to get more accurate with it and you get more destructive with it. So these... Uh, these rounds, these artillery stuff, man, I think this was able of targeting, I think 5,000 meters off with a five foot range of error in the hands of a skilled cannoneer. These things were devastating. These are the 12 pound, uh, the 12 pound Armstrong guns. Uh, these were, you know, the, the ability of Europe to marshal greater and greater forces. Um, Actually, hold on, let me check my notes. So I should mention there's one, one other factor that makes this so devastating, right? So um, the guy named Napoleon, he was a cannoneer when he first got started. Uh, he was actually doing the mathematics and calculating the logistics to run cannons. You, you'll see he actually contributes a small amount to mathematics, surprisingly, because of his experience as a cannoneer. And he, he came from a warrior culture. The warrior culture of France was feared I mean, now we just call them cheese-eating surrender monkeys, but like, like France back then was, whoa, their, their military was, was world like top notch. And that happened because of uh, the French Revolution in 1700s. They executed their king and all the royalty in Europe said, I want nothing to do with this. Uh, we need to stop these anti-monarchists from killing us. And so the entirety of Europe, basically all the royalty who were mostly at each other's throats, summoned a grand army to then just go stomp out this, uh, this, this uh, revolutionary France problem that they had. But the French, their response was called Levé en Mars, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing because I cannot pronounce French for the life of me, which means to conscript every single French male as a soldier. Every single one. That means if you're in a city, you're a deli person, you're a farmer, you've never held a gun before, it does not matter. You are now a soldier. They were so successful in repelling the monarchists that they were able to extend beyond their borders and set up revolutionary enclaves all throughout Rome, uh, all throughout Europe as well. Monarchists were not happy about this development. It severely backfired. But then again, they didn't even envision that it was possible to take every single male in your country and turn them into a soldier. This was not possible in most of history because if you turned your farmers into soldiers, who the hell was going to feed you? You were dead in a couple months. 
So you needed that dedicated farmer base, but the French, because they gutted their aristocracy, they were already screwed. They, they had to redo their entire order anyway. So they said, screw it, let's just make everybody a soldier and whoever survives, great, that's less criminals later on. It's a really cold calculation, but it was devastating. It resulted in these type of cannoneer developments as a result, surprisingly. So now the French who were uh, bringing all of their soldiers into the field, now every other monarchist had to do the same and every other republic had to do the same. So now they're fielding these huge amounts of people just to stay competitive. And here comes the artillery, which is just chewing through people. And you really start to see this come World War I, where artillery is just, I mean, crushing people, absolutely eliminating entire squads of people. And they get better and better with it, with it over time. So we start dealing with these industrial armies as they're able to raise greater and greater populations and give them greater and greater technologies and very spiffy little helmets that look like trees. Uh, we, we start to see that, hey, we need to counter, not only can we raise these armies, but we need to counter them too. Um, and artillery is a pretty good bet right now. Yeah, there's airplanes and all that stuff, but artillery is really the, that's the creme de la creme of just grinding out meat. So we need to make sure that these artillery gets a little bit better. Um, this was the birth of the computer. You know, the computer you and I are using right now, this is ENIAC. ENIAC was designed to calculate artillery round precisions, not just for individual shots, but also for rolling artillery. When you barraged, multi when you fired multiple artillery pieces over a great distance at specific time intervals under different winds, under different pressures, those under different grains, and they would land in coordination to maximize the devastation for whatever was requested uh, according to the spotters. And you could have a team of mathematicians in the field doing that, but um, World War I was brutal. You, you could not put brain power on the front line. They'd, they'd die of uh, trench foot or they'd get trench foot. They would get infected. They would get rat bites. I mean, serious problems. You couldn't keep that brain power on the front line. So you kept them in the back, but then you had to radio back and forth and it was a mess. So all of this logistics overhead starts to explore the R&D of computational services like or computational engines like the ENIAC. And the, the hilarious irony is that when ENIAC finally comes online, it doesn't, it doesn't calculate a single thing about artillery when it comes online. The first thing it's used to calculate is, is nuclear weaponry, which, is, which then leads us to our unfortunate outcome where, well, now we got nukes. So let's take artillery and instead of every shell blowing up like a 20 foot radius, let's say every shell blows up a two mile radius. Uh, now we got some serious problems. And then throw some planes in it that can deliver it really quickly, then tip them on a missile and now they can really drop all over the place Then put them in a submarine and who knows when they can attack you. So this nuke problem is uh, hard. So how do you make sure that you don't get nuked? Well, you, you over nuke yourself, you, you overproduce your nukes. So if you're gonna nuke me, well, I'm gonna nuke you. Okay, so mutually assured destruction. All right, a little bit of game theory, fine. But what if I knock out your first strike capability or your retaliatory capability? So let's say I hit your telecoms. I start taking your satellites out. I start hitting your, your, your fiber optics, your, uh, your ocean fiber. All right, that's a problem. But what if my networks self heal? What if my telecoms can still route to each other even if you take out a core hub? Well, congratulations, we just invented packet switching, which is the core of the internet. The internet works because of packet switching, TCP IP packet switching. And this was developed to ensure first strike capability in a nuclear bombardment scenario so that game theory of MAD could be sustained. So the internet exists because of artillery. That's a weird thing to say, but there is a direct line of reasoning that actually um, su supports that argument. And then of course we get the, you know, now that we're on the internet, now we have memes fighting each other and it's just self-referential be funny. We're all quite familiar with meme war. I probably don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, basically, memes are the Kalashnikov of cyber semiotics. You know, if you have a narrative and it's really tightly manicured, uh, we can kick that fucker sideways, no problem. So these, these things are, ooh, these things are evil. So that's, uh, that's basically the history of war from chariots to uh, funny little Zoomer memes. So let's look at the, let's start looking at the numbers and participation of modern warfare uh, in, the, in the current space. This is a, that's uh, from World Bank, yeah, from World Bank. We're starting to see the, the per, this human participation in militaries across the world decline in relation to their population size. We're not talking like 
severe declines in the absolute number of soldiers that exist. That's still pretty damn high. Um, but in terms of the total share of the population, it's much lower. It's decreasing considerably, although there was a spike in Africa. Um, you know, if you're ever curious to look in that one, you want to look at, I think, uh, Liberia. Yeah, that spike probably comes from Liberia and Zimbabwe and, and all the Hotel Rwanda type stuff. Um, but, you know, Cold War is on its way out, man. We don't have to do this stuff. Now we can play finance games. Now we can blackmail each other. Woohoo! You know, it's, you know, you don't need soldiers all over the place. So let's look at these numbers. Here's uh, superpowers throughout time. Each one of the, you know, thousands of soldiers. You know, here's your, so this is 450,000 and this is a million, 1.2. Uh, you'll see this is broken into West versus East. You'll see at the very beginning, the East has a significant advantage. So this is a very strong indicator of, of organization, of logistical talent, of having a stable government and a heavy focus on stable government because fielding these types of numbers, that's not easy. And you know, admittedly, when you're dealing with the East, they didn't have the, the military brilliance that you see coming from uh, the Middle East and Europe and early parts of North Africa, uh, they are able to field very large numbers, um, but not with a degree of, of great skill in terms of like, you know, sending um, um, signals to here and then delaying your attack and then moving it here. And they're operating at a much larger pace in the East. They're not dealing down with like these individual tactics, although most of the fighting does boil down there because once the fight starts, it's, it's all individual tactics and, and sword play and that type of thing. The East is, is actually aligning their armies and their strategies much more towards dynastic assumptions. So they would raise these large armies and just having the large army was enough to not have to deploy it. So they're thinking these things as like more and more bodyguards. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how, how the East looks at military versus how the West does it. And most of the West in the early part, I mean, you get to the Romans, they have a good run here. Um, but, but again, I mean, the, most of this is the Middle East and, and their early advantage with Mesopotamia. France comes along and does something cute in the 1300s, but you know, for the most part, this is Middle East. They get a, Middle East gets a really good run for this whole span of time. And again, just highlighting that type of stuff. So now we're looking at things changing. And they change for the reasons that we've already gone over. We're seeing the French and the Germans, a lot of the Germans and the Russians, and the United States eventually gets mostly because of the Civil War. Of course, leave it to the United States to raise the most amount of soldiers against its own people. Uh, but that's a different story. Um, you see the French does the same thing with their revolution. Uh, the Russians, they hit their revolution, but they're in the middle of a war with Germany in World War I at this time, so not really the case. But the Germans and the Russians, yeah, my God, those guys in World War, uh, World War I were just brutal. They were just massacring each other. It was, it was nuts. Um, and you see a decline, even though the absolute numbers are pretty high. Uh, you see this, like, petering off in the East. They're slowly being isolated because of colonialism. They're slowly losing their... their advantages here and there. Conquering the land masses of, Euro of, of Eurasia is no longer a good enough strategy. The West is just surpassed in terms of naval force. And because of naval force, they have access to the entire world. The East did not have this. And you see it in their military numbers. It's just not holding hard. Admittedly, the Japanese had a pretty good uh, run against the Russians, but that's a, that's a blip. That's a, when you look at the overall trend, um, you see the East is losing. The East is long-term losing here. I mean, the numbers are just meh. So now this is a breakdown of World War II, uh, which is a high, I mean, look at these numbers. Nine million soldiers. Nine million, are you serious? Twelve million? We sustained, we put 12 million soldiers? Holy Jesus. The, the, the German Reich had 12 million? I mean, these are huge, huge numbers. So this is what you would call peak industrial warfare, um, where you're able to deploy, you're able to use total warfare, uh, you're able to use mm, railroads and artillery and carrier pigeons, and it, every single creative instinct of the human talent is just dumped into slaughtering each other in this, in this like 10 year period. And you see it in these numbers, they're just extreme. Uh, the numbers don't get this high again. This is like, this is like never again type numbers. And a lot of our foreign policy is, has been, you know, designed to prevent this type of craziness. 
So then we get to the West. And this is where things start to get even. This is where things got interesting for a long time in history. The, the East is able to field numbers that the West can field in terms of absolute. Interesting. The, this is a, I mean, you look 50s and on, that's modernization, that's globalization. So now the East is able to channel, they're able to not only have access to the, the, the trade route that the Europeans had formed in the colonial and sale period, um, they're able to compete commercially. They're able to consolidate their means of production. They're able to have access to capital in ways that were previously not accessible. And you see it in their military growth, it's there, right? So now we have almost an even fight Hmm. How does that resolve? I mean, we're starting to see it right now. These numbers stop at 2014, but Trump's very anti-China. And with these numbers, who knows what happens, right? Well, let's see what happens when we start changing a little bit of the technological premises. I mean, that's, that's some crazy numbers right there. So as, we, as we've noticed before, uh, we know that the hard participation of people versus population of military is going down and correspondingly, military expenditure as a percentage of GDP is also going down. Now that sounds crazy. You might think they're spending more and more now than ever before. Yes, but as a percentage of GDP, it's not technically true. Um, we're actually spending less and that's mostly because our personnel costs are drawing, going down. We need less people to kill more people. So there you go. Um, there's also another trick that's going on here, which I'll get into later. It's called hiding the numbers. How do you categorize military expenditure? Well, there's a way to actually categorize military expenditure that isn't military expenditure. Uh, and again, the other factor you need to look into, did the military spending go down or did the GDP go up? That matters because you get this result in either way. I don't need to cut spending to drop the percentage. I just need to raise GDP and my, maybe my spending is the same the whole time, comparatively speaking. It's just my GDP jumped up five times, but my military expenditure versus it probably halved. So that's a weird ratio, right? Where's, where's the rest of the remaining, that, where are those numbers hidden, right? Are they hidden at all? Um, so just keep these two things in mind. Someone tries to tell you that we're becoming a more peaceful world. Um, I think Steven Pinker has that argument a lot. Uh, th these numbers are, obviously clever ways to hide the accounting. So how do you hide those numbers? Because I alluded to it earlier, it's a thing called dual use. So dual use is a way to say, we want this weapon, but instead of paying the R&D for it, we're going to allow civilians to put their own capital into the development of the R&D. So that way it's not a military expenditure. It's just the economy, look at that. So let's take chemical manufacturing, for example, take Dow and, and DuPont and all those type of things. You know, that's, they can put their private capital into it and they can develop these huge things. And it does develop stuff like, you know, radium wristwatches that give you cancer or all types of other chemicals you need. Well, it turns out you can get a chemical artillery out of that too. Well, look at that. That's kind of strange. It's like, it's dual use. I'm getting the civilian aspect of it and I'm able to hide the numbers off the military expenditure books and, and treat it as um, capital. I'm sorry, treat it as um, uh, civilian, treat it as the economy. And then I take like a little bit off the top and I get my chemical artillery. Oh, neat, that's a neat trick. Can I do it again? Well, of course you could do it again, nuclear power. Well, let's generate, you know, we have 200 some odd nuclear power plants in America. And uh, turns out you can make a lot of weapons with that. So all the funding here is civilian, a mix of private and, a mix of private and public, yes, admittedly. Um, but that's all to offset the production of these type of things. So again, we're hiding the numbers in dual use. Reentry vehicle, super SpaceX stuff. We got to bring our astronauts back. Our astronauts back, man. We're space stuff, right? Woo, Elon Musk. Just kidding. It's a multi-reentry vehicle weapon that drops eight nuclear weapons on cities once it reaches peak orbit. So this is the same research to get the same weapon, and it never qualifies as, as military expenditure. Or more accurately, uh, the military expenditure for this is reduced because you have uh, it's reallocated in these categories instead. PlayStation 2 was actually classified as a dual-use item. Very strange. So it's the same damn thing. This was, uh, this was a clever piece of legislation done uh, I think it was Microsoft was pissed about this and they found a way to slap PlayStation 2 with a dual use as part of a, to, so it can be put under different um, uh, import export rules uh, so that they can get an advantage on Xbox. It was, it was a total mess. Leave it to Bill Gates. Surveillance capitalism, which is what we all know. 
Um, we're doing it, I'm talking into a camera right now, right? What is Silicon Valley, the developer of transistors and developer of AI and all that software stuff? Well, it's surveillance capitalism, sure, but well, it's also surveillance tyranny. So that's a dual use thing. Any type of surveillance equipment that's developed for us and we, you know, we tell ourselves this is cool and we have a dog walker app. Um, well, we also have apps that turn dogs into bombs. So it's, it's just, you know, it's the same thing. It's dual use. It's just all, this is all, I'm, I think I'm driving the point home here. So now let's talk about robotic labor force. We build robots to build stuff. Cool, right? We got that walking dog. Jeff Bezos has that. That's cute, creepy, but cute. Boston Dynamics has this robot that's supposedly testing the clothes of, of soldiers, right? But it's a, it's a robotic labor force, but the dual use is that it's a military force as well. So dual use is a way to hide the expenditures. And once you start doing this game, it becomes so useful that it turns out you're powering your entire economy from this thing. From this mechanism alone, you are actually powering your entire, you're driving the entire capital flows into your economy, especially here. I mean, the dot com, I mean, imagine if Google and Facebook and all the blue chips in Silicon Valley hit like $20 a share, we'd, we'd be in the Stone Age. So as these things expand, they actually take over the economy because of this trick here, which then leads to the insane asylum. So the other dual use thing that I didn't get into is steel. Steel is a magical piece of metal. It's flexible, it's hard, it's powerful. It's a, four, it's a real estate multiplier. As you build like skyscrapers, you turn one piece of land into like 30 pieces of land and you get multiples on your investment. Railroad can move stuff from point A to point B pretty quick. So now you can actually maximize the economy, the economic performance of much smaller nodes in your civilian network. So we're going to build steel everywhere. It's magical. Just throw steel at it. What do you want for Christmas, kid? Ah, oh, here's some steel. We're just going to throw steel everywhere. And then it's so powerful that we've already saturated all the possibilities in our own economy. We've built every bridge, every skyscraper, every railroad that can be even close to economically efficient. Now we got to spread it everywhere else. We got to ship it to Germany. We got to get the steel to Britain. We got to get the steel to India, the steel to China. We got to steal the whole place, right? No pun intended. So we're going to put the steel everywhere, which is great. But because we mass produce so much steel, it now just, the price just drops. We have done nothing but produce steel to the point that it's like one cents a pound because we've made it so globally available. Well, now we got an issue because steel production is actually pretty capital intense, um, e even if you spread it all over the world. And people need their money back. We got investors, baby. So how are you going to get that money back? How are you going to re recover that, that massive heavy expenditure into your steel productions? Aha, I know what to do. I can make weapons out of steel to blow up all the other steel things that I've built so I can increase the demand for steel later on. This is called the insane asylum. And we've been here since 1940. So this dual use, we're building, this is how dual use evolves when it gets real circular, when it turns into an Ouroboros. We get our dual use, so cool, we got this thing, we got this thing. You know, we get here, steel's at its cheapest. Ah, now we can start building weapons out of it. We can R&D out of it. We can really experiment with it, right? So this is how you hide dual use and how you build these Ouroboroses. This is also known as the military industrial complex, but this is more of the control paradigm. What I was talking about in the previous slide is the, uh, the economic insanity, the economic insane circle, uh, when you start taking dual use to its most efficient. Um, now, in this case, everybody knows the military industrial complex, it's called congressional consumer corporate surveillance complex and probably a bunch of other describers after that. Um, Congress has tax funding for the Department of Defense, which then issues contracts to defense contractors who issue campaign contributions back to Congress and round around we go, right? So this is a driver for the, this basically develops those dual use circles of insanity that I was talking about previously. This is also known as military Keynesianism for all you economy nerds who want to take a crack at it. So we're going to, let's, let's keep this in mind for the next couple slides. Okay, so this is where Intel's Moore and Mikhail Foucault become the economy. I'm gonna specifically talk in terms of surveillance capitalism. This is the GDP per capita, and this is median household income. And this is often described as a wealth gap, but that's not true. Um, 
it feels like a wealth gap, but the reason it even formed is because we, the Fed has a dual mandate. Federal Reserve has a dual mandate to keep, price, to keep prices low uh, and to keep the demand for the dollar high. So what this is actually doing is this is proof that the Fed is doing its job. This is proof that the promise to keep cost of living price controls are in place is working. Because if you didn't have this line, if, this, if median household income increased as GDP per capita increased, then what would happen is the price of everything would be crazy high. You'd be, you'd be paying ex ex enormous amounts of money for all kinds of stuff. So therefore you'd be getting less consumer driven stuff. And I'm, I know I'm using 1930s models here. Um, so if anyone's having an aneurysm in chat, I apologize. Um, but this is, uh, this, is, this is proof that the, uh, the cost of living promise is being respected. And you can just go to Walmart and see that. I mean, how often do, does Walmart prices change? They don't change very much. You can still go to Walmart and buy almost anything there to a degree, put on layaway or a credit card for more pricey items. But the reason Walmart's even ex accessible to most human beings in the, in the country is because of the price, the cost of living and price control promise that's implied in what the Federal Reserve mandate is. And this gap is proof that it's working. So it looks like a wealth gap, but it's actually policy. So how do you get that? How do you keep that gap increasing or how do you keep that, pro, uh, that cost of living in, in check? Well, you gotta use technology to produce more goods at, at cheaper rates. Um, and if your country has full of unions or it's full of people who are expensive uh, and professionals, then just ship that shit somewhere else, buddy. We're going to, we're going to China, we're going to Thailand, Vietnam, India, man. We're, and you notice as we go to these countries, it's 1960, then modernization happens. And look at that, the exports as percentage of their GDP starts to skyrocket. Meanwhile, GDP per capita goes up because financial services take over the economy because they're managing this growth and everybody else's, um, uh, the cost of living is held, it's maintained because we are basically deferring um, the, I meant to say production costs, not wages. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Um, the production costs are being held in line in relation to this so that we can get this. This in turn leads to Moore's law because we have outsourced a lot of the, we've outsourced a lot of the tinier, uh, the, the more, I'm sorry, we, we've outsourced the less complicated stuff to other nations that are on the rise in terms of de development, we're able to then take some of these people from here, specifically the people who are managing this line, and get them and retrain them to start looking into information manufacturing. So that's like, that's like Silicon Valley, that's like chip pr uh, pr uh, production, um, that's semiconductors, all those types of things. So we're able, because of this system, we're able to start really developing Moore's Law as a byproduct of this because this requires more and more research into crazy, crazy stuff uh, in order to even get to this point, although we're starting to hit serious problems uh, probably around this point. And that's because just quantum physics is a total pain in the ass. So, so these two things have a significant impact on the development of this. So if any one of these go out of whack, you can start seeing this number to go down as well. That should be a, that should be a, pretty, in, that should pre, be a pretty solid indicator according to what I'm proposing here. Which of course leads to economic, uh, because we have more information processes, more, oh, it's Henry, whoa, it's this guy again. Hey, how you doing? That's great. Hold on, Henry, hear me out, hear me out real quick. Um, we got Moore's Law and it's creating more and more transistors and more and more information processing. And so we're basically quantizing human behavior. That's basically what the 1990s onward has been. All growth has been about quantizing human behavior um, for financial services, risk management, uh, for, uh, marketing reasons for expansion of capital and allocations of capital. Uh, all of this has been driven primarily by the fidelity and the resolution that this has been increasing over time and over time. And why is that happening? One, because the manager risk, which means there's social friction caused by the price controls. That's not clear. That's not obvious. So it turns out that when you keep people poor here and everyone else is getting rich, that tends to cause social friction. Weird, weird, you know, weird relationship, right? Even though this system can be explained as this is actually not a bad deal for most people. It certainly doesn't feel like that sometimes, especially when you can't pay your medical bills or whatever happens. Uh, but this was the promise of the Fed. This is what they said they would do. So 
and then there's a more insidious part about price controls because we're keeping not necessarily the, the production side here. We've already outsourced most of the hard production here, um, but this is consumption for us, right? So this is the cost of living. So this is consuming. Um, there's also a, a, an insidious friction that is not internal. It's actually external, meaning I have either a cheap labor pool or a cheap consumer pool, and now other nations want to take it for themselves. So think when, uh, when America went into Japan and we said, hey, Commodore Perry's here and you're going to open your market, so we're going to shoot all of you. Well, there you go. That's an example of you know, taking someone else's labor pool and taking someone else's markets. So as you get better control of your human behavior, you start attracting the sociopaths. And so you think you need more of this and you need more of this to keep these guys away. But by making more of this, these guys get better. So this system, this, this shit doesn't hold. So this is where game A has some serious problems. Right? Just, pfft, off the cliff it goes. You'd think it goes off the cliff, but uh, I wouldn't count it out for, I wouldn't, it, it can tap out, but it's not going to. Um, and so I'll explain why it doesn't have to. And that's primarily because of opportunism. So let's look at jujitsu in the morn for cold dojo. Um, it's gonna focus on, on this little tidbit. I'm just gonna roll it out and you're gonna, you're gonna piece it together, I promise. So 9-11, oh God, what the fuck, right? So bang, you know, planes hit building with the shit. I know it's a hell of a segue, I apologize. Um, Brussels and, and the EU is like, what the fuck, 9-11, this is terrible, right? Everybody's in solidarity, this is stupid, what the hell? You know, let's go after these guys in Afghanistan, what the fuck? So everyone's kind of in agreement here, right? It's like, it's also yellow cake, by the way. Woo I don't know if you remember that, you might, I don't know if y'all are old enough. Um, but it was this yellow cake thing, and that was supposed to justify going into here. Um, Brussels was like, damn, foiled our, damn it, <laughs> you weren't supposed to say that. It, 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 it screwed up our petro euro, god damn it. Um, so now everyone has to go into Iraq. Uh, and so it's multi-coalition force for the most part. You notice it's like uh, I've surgically removed Saudi Arabia from this whole thing. Uh, the rest of the region is completely trashed, by the way. Um, because we go into Iraq. And so it's just sectarian strife. Just like, boom, Shiites and uh, Sunnis just completely uh, decimating one another. And mostly because of the de-radicalization technology we've been using, but that's another conversation for another time. Um, of course, not Saudi Arabia though, they're okay. Um, in fact, they're quite happy with this arrangement because they're able to make their competition for oil production murder each other. They don't have an army that's worth a damn, but they have our army because they have our oil. So, Put two and two together, right? So what does this do? Well, this is, this is like 30 years war, but for this region of the world. Uh, it's just neighbors murdering neighbors. They don't tell you that in the media, but that's what's going on. And that's what's driving a lot of the immigration to Europe is because of that mess. Everyone, anyone who's migrating here sands the obvious radicals who were trained under, you know, spooky conditions, but people who are moving here and aren't radicalized, um, uh, their neighbors, they realize their neighbors aren't saying their opportunities are gone. They basically have to sell their labor to where it's stable, to where this kind of crap isn't happening. So of course they're gonna go to Europe. It's, it's like a bus ride or a boat ride and you get to Europe, right? Uh, look, German Karen, there she is. She's the queen of all that's moral. Now she's gonna take them all in, look at her go, right? She's the, she's the, real, uh, she's the real MVP, right? Just kidding, Germany gets cheap labor in 15 years. That's the real play. So this is an example of taking these moments of instability as game A screws up and turning those into gold for game A. So I could do this all day. It has been doing this. This is what it does. This is the game. It's jujitsu in this dojo of insanity. It's how do you roll at the moment? How do you, how do you get the maximum opportunity out of this stuff? So it's always seeking for that type of stuff. And it has no problems displacing entire populations. That's just the MO, that's just what they do, right? It's been that way forever. So this is why game A can stay on life support. It can do this forever and it has done this forever. I, I wouldn't say they just kind of wake up and suddenly have a uh, crisis of conscience. I, I would not assume that's the case. Um, so let's instead look at what game A can do if they were smart. And that involves robotic nationalism. So what is robotic nationalism? Well, it's the dual use concept that we've described in the previous slides where we 
intentionally create robotic soldiers so that the robotic soldiers go to war with each other so that every time a robotic soldier gets shot down, it creates 50 to 70 jobs. So the robots aren't actually shooting people. That, that's Terminator, James Cameron crap. I'm talking two nations going to war with each other, throwing only robots at each other so that they can guarantee 100% employment for their nations. Not far-fetched. We've done this before. I've, I've walked you through us doing this. We did this with steel, except you know, we killed people to do it, mostly the uneducated and criminals and all those type of things, but you celebrate them as heroes later on, that type of thing. That's What I'm proposing is that you don't have to kill anybody. Nobody has to die. So let's look at where those hot spots kick off. Let's see what's interesting. Conscription and corruption are difficult things to merge together. Now, there's different types of corruption. You can have corruption at the federal level where you don't trust your federal leaders, like say most people don't trust Trump, or you can have corruption at the local level where you don't trust your local police department. It's different perceptions depending upon where you go, and it can be a mix of both, totally possible. So I'm just gonna use, uh, I forget where I got this chart from, it doesn't matter. Um, we're just going to use a corruption index because they're all just made up anyway. Um, we're going to see if we can find countries that are drafting, who, who are doing mostly male drafts, uh, with the exception of these guys. And, uh, and it, this also doesn't show co the difference between compulsory drafting and, and volunteers. So like Turkey is compulsory. Um, and I think Russia is, is volunteer. I forget. Um, but everyone signs up for like, um, selective service in some capacity it can be called upon later on. But th these are, and America has that. Um, but I'm talking about like military draft. It's always active. It's part of the culture. So now let's identify places where the draft is going on and corruption is really high. The lower the number, the higher it is, right? So we're looking at the old kingdom of Kush. We're looking at Turkey. We're looking at Russia. Is that Venezuela, Bolivia? Um, then we're looking at Mexico, right? So what we have here is a case where if the leaders of that country say, hey, we need to draft you because of a war, there's a good chance that people are going to be like, fuck right off. I'm not going to do that because you're corrupt and that's that, right? So now your military draft is less of a nationalized galvanizing moment and it's more of like, well, we'll pick who we can get, right? So this means that these nations in particular are really susceptible to requesting robotic soldiers because they can't draft enough people because they're corrupt and they're not gonna fix their corruption. There's too much money. So these, these are hot spots to bring robots in because they're just greedy and, they, and their people know they're greedy and their people want nothing to do with that game. So they're gonna bring the robots in. Now it's also true in the inverse. It's not just corruption that's a driver for robotic warfare demand. It's also success. Now that sounds weird, but let me give you an example. These are the number of deferments between 1948 and 2005. I won't tell you the country yet, but you might notice that uh, deferments are when people are drafted, but they say, ah, I want to go. I want to go to college or I want to go start a business or do something, right? So I want to do something other than, you know, I want to participate in the civilian economy instead of being drafted. So these deferments are just going way up right, over time. And what's causing that? Well, I have unaccountable power influencers. You see these people getting money. I want money too. I want to play that game. I want to make the money game. So why am I serving? No, fuck that. I'm deferring. I'm going to, I'm going to make some money. You have entitled civil servants who are okay with these deferments. Usually they're like, you should not be deferring, go serve your country, but they're making money too. So fuck it. Right. And then maybe the citizenry is just so they don't even care. They have no national identity. They're just like, fuck it. Right. Oh, and what country am I talking about here? I'm talking about Israel. Those are the numbers for Israel. That is a country that has been at war since its founding. All of its neighbors want to kill it. And what's happening? Their success, which is a very successful country by, by um, modern metrics, uh, they don't want to fight anymore. These citizens do not want to participate in a military draft. So their own success is actually gutting their own military, surprisingly, which means you're going to need robots to fill the gaps. All their neighbors want to kill them, probably vice versa. You're going to need some robots for that. So either heavy, heavy corruption or heavy success will both drive robotic warfare in either case because the demand to fill, you know, person online with gun has to get fulfilled. 
So then let's talk about how to take this concept and scale it across the entire planet, not just the hotspots, not just the exceptions, but make it everywhere at the same time. Here's our favorite fat cat we all like to make fun of because we're poor. And uh, reliable pay pay uh, loyal citizens. <laughs> uh, we need to crush to rally the enemy. Um, nah, you're a reptilian pedivore, fuck off, right? So they're not, they're not doing that stuff. They're not feeling it. So uh, we already know the enlistments are going to be low, so they got to hire mercenaries. They're going to reach for mercenaries first. They're going to go to Z, Blackwater, and Triple Canopy, and those kind of people. And uh, pay for pewpews.com and that type of stuff. So you can bring in your dudes and, you know, you can shoot you know, mercenaries. They're not loyal. They don't necessarily fight to the last man, um, but they shoot people. So that's good, right? So, oh, look, it's Eric Prince. Look at him. He's very happy for the business. Look at him go. Uh, but this is Eric Prince. Now, if you never researched this guy. This guy's a cutthroat business dude in the traditional mercenary sense. For example, uh, a history of mercenaries. There's <laughs> one case. I think it was a German prince who hired a mercenary firm to sack Rome in the 1500s. And the, the mercenary firm was successful. They sacked Rome. And then they said, well, you've already paid us for the successful part. Pay us twice and we won't burn the entire city down. Ah, right. So got to be careful with mercenaries because they will fuck you in the middle of an operation. So maybe he's looking at you like you're a weak motherfucker, you know, execute order 66 and overthrow this twerp. You know, he's like, okay, lol, that's hilarious. So now you got a problem. You can't really go to mercenaries as to go to because there's this cost and penalties associated with that. It's like, oh, all right, well, let's go to IMF. Like, give us some defense loans. Like, I, I need soldiers because I'm greedy and these people know I'm greedy and this is scary, so help, right? You go to the you go to IMF. You're like, ah, man, we, you know, we've hit up everybody. We've hit the mafia. You know, they, nobody wants to fund you. You're a piece of shit. Ah, but I just got a phone call. Hear me out. I got something for you. So there's this, like, robotic infrastructure fund that's coming, and we just happen to have access to it, and you're entitled to it because you're an IMF member, but if you sold your top of the waterfall place in that fund, we can get you that money. We'll get you that. Now, what does that mean? That means this person says, hmm, instead of building my own infrastructure to help my people, these people will do it for me. I can then take the money from selling the claim to then purchase the military I need for whatever the hell I need it for. Ah, interesting. So now I'm giving up my own national destiny to build up an infrastructure fund so that I can build my immediate needs for military stuff. And then I'll spin the whole thing as saying I'm creating jobs. And then, you know, make Earth great again, 2020X. And, he, you know, this guy somehow won in this whole situation where he was certainly doomed from this factor alone. But here, you can, you can play some fun games. Okay, so that's one country, right? So now let's, let's tip over to the next tip part of this. I call it the robo dollar, I'm like the petro dollar, but robots because it's robot evening robots everything so here's a uh, country cluster one country cluster two you know, greedy fat dude we all hate robot infrastructure deal that's set up and the workers for both situations right and imf sitting here pretty we're looking at westphalia 3.0 because remember blackmail inflation destroyed westphalia 2.0 it's like oh god wait you funded this guy but you gave him robots now because he has robots now i need robots because if i don't have robots then he can invade me because he has a bigger force. So now I need robots. Like, ah, IMF, help, right? You cut a deal with this guy, cut a deal with me. I need help. He's like, hmm, interesting. The more I fund this, the more I can spread it. What an interesting correlation. I can now get more loan obligations to me, and all I have to do is forgive debt and convert that into a robo-investment. So all these countries have stupendous amounts of debts with IMF. If the IMF was willing to forgive the debt in exchange for that top of the line, top of the waterfall claim on any type of robotic infrastructure fund, well, they'd drop that debt in a heartbeat. They'd drop that debt worldwide in a heartbeat. You're talking Jubilee level of dropping debt. I mean, these countries are absolutely walking. They'd love that. They couldn't get enough of that because they have to because, oh, no, Hungary has robots. I'm Serbia. Now I need robots. Now everybody needs robots, and it just spreads, right? Now the citizens don't care. 
you know, they're quite happy the fact that they have jobs. Like, oh, great, more robot infrastructure, five G or whatever. I'm building, I'm building all my infrastructure. Up. I'm getting jobs in a in a mass unemployment scenario. Great. Um, then they're staring at each other, realizing they're probably locked in this robot building arms race because now they both have robotic soldiers. They're corrupt as hell. They're not getting deals. These people are not joining the military anytime soon, despite the fact that they're impoverished because now they have a vehicle to get jobs and participate in their economy. So they're certainly not going to join the military in bulk, not like a, a conscription allows. And now these guys have to build robots because they, they rely more and more on the robotic forces for defense and less and less on, on human you know, meat shield participation. So now we got to build the robots and so now you got robots and that, that takes work. So now that's more jobs. And then you start dropping the suggestions. Like, you know, it'd be a real shame if these guys went to war. They shouldn't go to war. You know, war would be a bad idea. I sure hope they don't go to war because war would, would destabilize everything. And you just keep saying war over and over again before you know it, someone starts thinking war. Like, oh yeah, I'm war. I should go to war. That sounds great, right? Now I got a robot war for whatever reason. Maybe it's uh, maybe this guy hates this guy or, or whichever the case may be. Something initially pops off organically, some dumb stuff. You don't have to you know, put economic hit in there. But in the back of everyone's mind, they start to realize a conclusion. They start to realize that every robot that dies in this war is 30 to 70 jobs for everyone involved. And so now instead of Look at all those jobs are getting jobs everywhere. They took our job. No, we got our jobs back. So this is, this is the conclusion that's reached once this kicks off and other people will see it and they'll go, I want 100% employment too because all my people are burning down Minneapolis right now. So here's a way out of that type of problem and everyone's going to see this. All it has to do is work once. Once this conclusion is even tasted, just once, you're going to see the whole shift. You're going to see the entire interpretation of economic shift towards this, this robotic military Keynesianism and steer policy towards it to then uh, keep uh, civilian participation involved, keep uh, debt restructuring options on the table, make sure that you can defend your homeland, and also, I already covered jobs and debt. Uh, that's that, Just those three alone is enough to, to really fundamentally alter the order of how the world organizes itself. Especially if America was to say disengage from all of its previous responsibilities, um, this is certainly on the table as an option. Whether it works or not, well, let's look into what happens here. Oh, look, it's everybody's favorite rhetoric. He's out here. He's very convinced that this all sounds nice and well, um, but what if they take robots and dump them in a population center? So what if they don't? You know, what if they don't steer themselves towards this ideal state where it's robots versus robots? What if they decide to pull a Hitler and say, well, I'm just going to invade your population centers and fuck it, right? That's a feasible, that's a feasible thing. You could do that because robots are cheap and population centers are expensive. And so they're soft targets and you'd hit them hard. And of course, there's an obvious advantage for that in a total war scenario, of course, but there's also exterminatus. And I got 18 billion reasons why this works. These motherfuckers are off the table, meaning that's Prince al -Waid. He's an $18 billion net value. He was hung upside down and had the shit kicked out of him for six weeks straight. This is Claire Bronfman. She ran a sex cult slash human trafficking thing. She's been in court ever since Trump got elected. And we all know who these guys are. So all these untouchables, we can touch them. So if any one of these people decide to step out of line and start throwing robots at humans, we can touch you. We have 19 billion reasons and 19 billion reasons why we can touch you. So it doesn't matter how much money you got. You can get exterminated. We'll take you off the table, no problem. So I'm not really concerned about this one because anyone who's trying to put that together, they can be taken off the table. So what we do, we can update our Geneva protocols and say robot versus human is a war crime. We don't want that. Now, we're not out here trying to exterminate everybody and fulfill Malthus and that whole group. We're interested in making sure that if these robots are coming, let's put this thing on a sane leash and say, hey, how can we benefit from humans? These robots are coming with or without us. You can't just dig your head in the sand and be like, oh, no, the robots, oh, God. No, they're, they're here. Just fucking work it out. Let's start here. Let's make this a war crime. You can totally do this. You're not forbidding the creation of robotic war machines, but we're saying when you deploy them on humans, it's a war crime. And if you disagree, out you go. Get out of our system. We want nothing to do with you. 
So now let's talk about the other problem, which is unemployment. Because you put more robots in, you're going to have less demand for people, right? And study after study tends to show this. Uh, you're looking at these circle radiuses imply um, commuting zones. So larger cities have bigger circles, et cetera. Um, and you're looking at this trend when you take all the bubble graphs and you know you walk down the median and you'll see that you do have more unemployment as you move along the line as uh, more robot use happens. So you have less robot use and it's funny, you actually have spikes of severe unemployment when you have less robot use. And then you get to a more steady, predictable unemployment when you get more robot use, which is, there's actually some funds that can benefit from that surprisingly. But there's a key distinction here, right? Everybody says unemployment this, unemployment that, robots gonna do anything. Ah, hold on now, let's look at this word private real quick. I said private employment goes down. I didn't say public employment goes down. Now I'm talking robotic nationalism where robots are out there shooting robots and people are put in dual use scenarios to then produce those robots. And AI is probably stupid right now. So let's put humans to control and pilot those robots. So even if this slips, what I've done is I've created a mechanism that allows for public employment to offset this. Now I'm sure there's a libertarian somewhere screaming bloody murder at this whole concept. Yeah, sure, that's true. Broken window fallacy, of course, that's all very true. But this is coming, whether you like it or not. There's no economic tone that you can point to and say, but this book is gonna stop the road. That's not happening. The robots are here, the technology is here. How are you gonna play jujitsu in this dojo? You can't, you can't just go off the mat. You got to roll with the punches here. It doesn't have, I'm not, I'm not proposing permanent public employment. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying transitional. Yep, that's the best I can offer at this point. Because other than that, then it's just like, ugh, everyone's paranoid. So let's look at the three points here. Uh, that, that why this is feasible and why this would even be sought after. This whole, you know, spiel. Uh, because of dual use, um, the, public, the, uh, the private sector can absorb a lot of the R&D costs. And once you get to the warfare scenario where the robots are fighting each other, that drives costs down further as the employment goes up because you need more robots for every robot that's destroyed, but you need the robotic infrastructure, you need communication, you need manufacturing production, you need allocation, you need trade, stable trade between every, every player in the game. So as we pursue this road, as long as we're not expending human capital like we were in World War II in the steel cycle, in the robot cycle, it's feasible to get the cost of robots down very far and without a permanent reliance on human misery and human expenditure to keep those costs low, like we do need with steel. This probably pisses off the Malthusians something awful, but go pound sand. Once you get to the point where all of these nations have these robotic armies and they're doing their geopolitical dance with each other, a little tribal stuff, you're gonna hit a Pareto frontier. Meaning there's going to be only so many more configurations of robotic conflict until no more geopolitical advantage is discovered. There's only so many ways you can possibly rejigger that. And that's called a Pareto frontier. Once you hit that space, you will have very high employment for everyone that's part of the uh, of public employment at least. Um, and that then tips into a swords to plowshare scenario. Now, why is that? Because the entire economies of all these nations will be modernized uh, in, the, in the robotic sense, at least. They will have a surplus of robotic forces that are not, remember, these are dual use. So not only are they starting as soldiers, but they can be doubled back as workers. They can be brought back as a labor facility, which, of course, is going to drive this private unemployment down. And we know that, right? But why do we want that? That sounds like, okay, I've explained all this stuff, but why do we want that, right? Because when you have an abundance of workers, the cost of work, the cost of labor drops dramatically, like extremely. So now things that were previously too expensive become accessible. So whether it's deep earth mining, whether it's asteroid mining, all of these things that traditionally had bars that were crazy too high, because we have a surplus of labor, a massive surplus of labor that is disconnected from traditional ways of managing labor at least, we can now access these previously inaccessible sectors. And once you get to here, then the whole game changes, the whole shit changes because now you can take the premise of capitalism, which is infinite growth, and, or at least financial capitalism has the premise of, of infinite growth. And we can actually, I think, 
Uh, I think, Connie, if you're here, you had mentioned a great snippet from Daniel Suarez's book where he's making roughly the same argument where he says, um, banking is ideal for space economics. In fact, it's almost as if it was designed for it. This endless expansion into this resource laden, this re infinite resource space. Um, probably not so good when you hit peak saturation of, of, of humans on a tiny planet, but when you hit vastness, almost incomprehensible opportunities, um, that type of financial capitalism actually is incredibly functional. So that's where things might be ticking with or without your permission for game A at least. And game A can use this and will most likely use this to continue its extension, to continue its time in the game outside of the scumbag uh, jujitsu it's been doing since at least 2001. Uh, if they decide to get their act together and operate as a unified force, it wouldn't be hard for them to put all this together and knock it out the park. So remember, if you want a robot army, you got to have a VPN you can trust. It has to be quantum proof. So <laughs> that's all, folks. Thanks a lot. Nice. Okay. <laughs> um... So if you have your questions, uh, start putting in the chat box. Uh, if you want me to read on your behalf, uh, let me know. This will go on YouTube, so don't be an idiot. Um, first question, Pat, uh, for me. So I know you're plugged into the kind of the game B space, and uh, I, I imagine you had some conversations with the sense making mentions, matches about this kind of like uh, stuff. Um, do you have any like, criticism that you received that you thought was good? Or if you had none there in that space, um, what is the best counter argument that you heard when you presented this idea, or maybe you can play the devil's advocate to it? I've never heard anyone in game A counter, uh, game B counter this, uh, mostly because, I mean, no, I'm, I'm the only person, I'm like, I'm the only person who formulated this. I'm, I'm currently telling the story about these particular actors in Chain of Events, so obviously they've never encountered it. Um, and given some serious thought, I suspect that they, they would instinctively try to find tiny semantic exceptions and, and try to build a whole counter struggle against that. Um, maybe, I mean, it's cute, but I don't know if that's effective. Um, but it's, uh, it, when you seriously grok, like you get down to like the steel cycle. Once you understand the steel, the steel cycle, then I mean, that's, that's a heart of game A. So uh, game B would have to like critique this creative destruction force um, outside of like flattening the curve, which I think it's going for. It's saying, well, if, if it's going to peak and spike and cause damages, let's like extend it over the duration of time. And, and maybe we can turn that destruction into uh, opportunities for more and more people as we dampen it from populations. Maybe, you know, maybe that works. Um, a, a, a sort of a fractal dampener of the, uh, of the destruction of one of those steel cycles. Of course, that, that's all feasible. And I'm sure there's entire bodies of economics that can back that type of reasoning. Uh, but game A plays hard. They play super hard. Uh, they have no problem killing 100 million people and just batting an eye at it. So it, you got to realize you're up against psychopaths. And then when you throw the, or at least organized ones, when you throw the, the blackmail inflation on top of it, now you have disorganized psychopaths and that gets a little weird. So that gets really weird, in fact. So I think, I think with game B, uh, I'd like to target the spirit of what I think they're angling towards, which is why I'm going to save all that for next week, which is going to be game B's approach to this. Uh, as well. Interesting. Interesting. That was going to be my next question is um, what is your critique on game B? Cause I think in the blackmail inflation one, uh, you said that if game B doesn't work, we got to do this robotic uh, nationalism type thing. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's next week. We should yeah. say that one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. So let's pivot to the questions. Uh, Charles, you had a, a, a good question. Just, oh yeah, I gotta let people unmute themselves. Go ahead, Charles. Hey Pat, thanks for the time. My question was, um, this is my first time listening to you and you're clearly a very independent thinker and that's impressive. Uh, just walk us through briefly how you form your worldviews. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I'm an ex-Marxist. It's probably not too much a shock for people if, you, if you're really listening to the language I'm using. Um, I, I was a, the autistic Marxist, not the uh, I, I hate my parents and I want to overthrow the rich Marxist. I was the let's make sure that the, the delicate equilibrium between production and consumption is
was met and matched or at least acknowledged. Uh, so I was concerned about some abstract equation more than anything else. Uh, that changed when I encountered a book called The Human Swarm, written by Gregory Rollins, who fundamentally changed how I placed blame in history. And then I stopped placing blame on history. And then I started seeing human nature as it, as best as I could ascertain it in the raw. Um, and I haven't stopped since. I just like to understand what humans are doing, no matter how insane it is. And I like to not ascribe morality to it because I think it colors the observation of what is. And you can't change what is if you walk into it with assumptions of what should be. So I tend to try to capture as much of it as I can in the naked, in the raw. And then I'll figure out, let's, let's see what we can poke and see what we can change. Cool. Do you have a follow-up question, Charles? No? Okay, cool. Uh, so Ernesto wants me to ask this. Um, what would be the environmental implications of robotic wars, considering that they should be using depleted uranium shells and lots of batteries with toxic substances would be destroyed? Also, are they going to take place in the air, land, or sea? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very common question. So you're looking at maybe 1% of the surface of the earth is occupied, significantly occupied by, uh, by human beings. Yes, we're spread all over the place. And yes, we have farmland all over the place. But in terms of if you took all human beings and stacked them into one spot, it's really like 1%. So there's, there is a very large part of the earth in which you can have all these wars. And it's not that big of a deal. It's called the Sahara Desert. You can have these robot wars there all day long. And it's not going to disrupt that goddamn thing in terms of ecology. Now, the production of those robots will certainly probably have some pollution side effects down the stream, that's for sure. But there's all kinds of cool techniques that if you really were concerned about establishing an eco balance, um, these robots don't have to be made of, ro of metal. Don't just, just throw that expectation out the window. I can make their shells out of potato starch if I wanted to. I don't need these big like battle mechs from sci-fi. I just need things that just hunt you. I can have robots this big doing it. I don't need these massive monsters from the industrial age to you know, conduct my violent will here. So hemp robotics, right? Exactly, right? I, don't, I can make, it's, it's, I've seen technology where you can make circuit boards out of bamboo. It's not that hard, guys. You don't have to use uh, what China's selling to, to make these, these lethal robots. It's not that tough. So in terms of, you can have eco-friendly zero imprint robot war if that's a thing that needs to be marketed, I'm, which it sounds like it might be. Um, but it's, it's, it's within the realm of, of feasibility for sure. Cool. Kayashi, you have a question. If you can unmute yourself. Mr. Kayashi. Uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering, like, what makes you think that the robots are going to be expensive in job creating when they get destroyed versus just like attaching a bunch of explosives to a quad rotor drone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one robot, it's not as simple as press button, get robot. Um, you need to pay the licensing for the software. You need to put up the factory that can make it, whether it's a small factory or a large factory. Um, you need to constantly maintain it and improve it and there's a service required for that you need to make sure that the lenses and the servos and the, and, the, and the motors are manufactured as well you need to keep quality control and swarm management it's not just going to be one person per robot you're probably looking at one person controlling 100 robots with a bunch of intermediary good enough ais to assist in the person managing those fleets um, there is a lot of aggregate economics that can be extrapolated from this type of infrastructure so whenever a robot goes down through the aggregate, more and more jobs are created, not just in the production, but in the cleanup, management, recycling, propaganda, that, that, the, whole, the whole chain, you can include the entire economy off this alone. Cool. Okay, uh, this is uh, Will, he wants me to read on his behalf. Would scarcity of nation's natural resources be a problem for continuous robotic war? It would be a problem in terms of establishing equilibrium of robotic capabilities. So if you had one nation that happened to have access to rare earths and one nation that did not, there's a very good chance that the rare earth nation is probably going to have better information processing uh, just because of all of the techniques that rare earths can, can, 
um, are that's a well understood technology at this point. Uh, but as we see in World War II, during the hyper nationalist phase, nations surprisingly got along even without having access to an entire world system of trade that was functional. The Japanese were cut off from oil and tin. I, I, admittedly, they invaded you know their neighbors to get it back, but they were able to adapt even without it. Again, uh, you have you have interesting pressures that come into play when you're cut off of, of world trade and cheap labor and cheap material access and frictionless stuff that we've all become accustomed to. Um, when you have people who are facing the, the full brunt of mass unemployment, it's not as if everyone's lazy. It's just that the configuration of the economics are bad. And there will be people who, who will work to make sure that that configuration gets optimal again. The government has a huge incentive to do so in those situations. Or otherwise, the politicians get outvoted. Um, they have instability through their, through their federal system. Um, so there's, there's competing pressures that even if there are resource disequilibriums, uh, those competing pressures really will maximize human ingenuity to make do with the resources they have. And if they can't, which most of them won't, and that's true, they won't, that's where you cut deals and you form alliances with people. You say, put me under your robotic union because I can't produce robots and I need your protection. So that's, that's an adaptation as well. All right. Uh, oh, Rachel Haywire just dropped an qu interesting question. Rachel, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, so yeah, um, robot nationalism, interesting, interesting. I'm curious, um, where would robot dictators fall into this equation? From the media possibilities first. It would come from the media. So you're looking at populist dictators in this space will most likely arise from VR. That sounds weird, but I believe that question, I believe a question was asked last week about the impact of VR um, in, in, that's right. in, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. So the, the same reasoning applies there. Usually when you look, or I should say, when you look at the evolution of modern communication technologies, with every advancement of communication tech, you get a corresponding dictator who got to that position by exploiting mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So the advent of radio, um, that comes with things like, I'm going to say FDR is dictator, but what I mean is it's the central core of power. Um, uh, Vladimir Lenin heavily used radio. Uh, film was heavily used by the Germans in World War I under, under Kaiser Wilhelm. Uh, film and TV. Uh, Adolf Hitler was notorious in using audio techniques. In fact, the idea of mylar back tape was invented by the Nazis. And what they would do is they would record Adolf Hitler on this really high quality nylar tape, and then they'd ship the tape everywhere. And then they'd play speeches of him from different parts of Germany. So the allies would bomb these places thinking Hitler was there, but he was never there because the, oh, the rest of the world only had access to vinyl and vinyl was a shit quality sound. So the idea of this high resolution quality sound playing from somewhere else, obviously he was in front of the microphone. So, so media uh, revolutions tend to bridge the gap between the will of central state and how you normalize that to the rest of the masses. And so only mass communication can do that. So if you're asking what the dictators will look like, they won't be necessarily robotic per se, uh, but they will be part of the communication regime of those robot robotic economies. And that's probably going to be VR. Exciting. Yeah, right? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Did you have a follow-up question, Rachel? Or just want to give well, I'm some just more. thinking of the VR simulation of like the robot dictator, you know, and you put on the goggles and like it's this like <laughs> robot army of like marching robots. And, you know, I mean, maybe people like want to engage in those experiences because they want to imagine things. Like even if we don't have that, maybe that would just be like a fun artistic experience or something to have, you know, to like put on some goggles and like robot dictators, you know? I mean, that there's, I don't know. Could be, could be Ender's Game as well. Could yeah. be. Rachel's into some kinky shit. That's why we, that's why we love her. <laughs> um, Jacob, uh, you're up next. If you can unmute yourself. Sure thing. Do you hear me? All right. So I was just wondering what the sustainability of the system looks like. You called it Westphalia 3.0 and we're living, you know, in Westphalia 2.0 right now with the system of reciprocal blackmail sort of keeping everyone in check. But 
you know, in light of advancements, that's going to fall apart, like you said last week. So what do you see as a system that would come to replace this? Or, or how do you, if that's not something you can answer right now, how do you see this sort of playing out over time? Yeah. So I think um, the thing about these Westphalia systems is that we, we should probably stop calling them systems and we should probably start calling them stints, um, like little wedges of transformation for that time um, where this particular arrangement of here's how we're going to keep our psychopaths in check. And then that fell apart and we got to keep them in check. Here's how we keep them in check. And that's just, that's just going to change as, as time goes on. So even what I'm proposing here is still transitionary. Excuse me. It's ultimately the last transition uh, as much as I would like it to be one. I don't know if that's true, but I would like it to be one. Because once you have an abundance of robotic labor available, now astroeconomics is on the table. And at that point, instead of voting with you know, your ballot or your bots, you vote with your feet and you just fucking leave. Like, no, nah, we're done here. Like, oh, you have kings and you have nukes. I went off this crazy train. I'd rather go die on a poorly oxygenated rock than spend one more second next to these assholes. So you, you need to make the economics trend towards that mostly against the will of economics which is why i'm looking at this in a, a, a transitory phase itself because once you get astro economics then the whole the whole pie changes everything changes whether you have a westphalia system in that i don't think you will i think you'll have more of a replay of the, of the stone age where when people disagreed with one another they just ran across the, the horizon basically cool uh so my favorite poetry buddy, Key, has a question. Key, could you unmute yourself? No, I'm scared yet again. I'm not. I'm totally not. It's Sorry, fine. Key. It's it's great. It's it's. Thank you. Um, a lot for the time. Uh, that's the first thing that someone said here, and I appreciate that. Um, the question is, could you clarify the idea that banking is ideal for space economics? You mentioned someone, Daniel Suarez. Just mm. just wanted to understand that a bit more. Yeah, so um, the, the goal of, of financial banking is to pay off the interest. That's the entire purpose of financial banking. It serves, it, there is no other rule. Uh, everything else is organically derived as a result of that rule. So to understand what interest means, if I produce 10 pat bucks, I'm like here's 10 pat bucks, I just pop them into existence. And then I give them to you and I say, hey, you owe me 12 pat bucks. Now you might say, okay, that's fine, but there's only 10 pat bucks in circulation. Where are you going to get the other two from? Well, the answer is you can't. So obviously it's a game you lose. So now you owe me that money because you signed a piece of paper and I just got more goons than you. So now you're going to pay me those two pat bucks. You're going to pay me all 10 back because I know you got them. And then I'm going to get me, I'm going to get two bucks worth of actual assets you own. So that could be hours of your time or, property you have or some contract or some other asset that you evaluate, right? So I'm overproducing the demand for my pat bucks and underproducing the supply. That's the, that's the rule of financial capitalism. It's a, it's a game to trick people into overplaying their greed. And it works. It, it works all the time. Now, ideally, you want this game to be stable. You don't want it to be overtly predatorial when you're dealing with, you know, 6 billion people. But you can't hold everybody accountable. Contra everybody's free to write whatever contract they want, and you're going to fucking shoot yourself if you don't know what you're doing, or shoot yourself in the foot if you don't know what you're doing. So, you know, contract signer beware when you're playing financial capitalism games. But when you're playing the game of space, well, you don't need to go to lawyers, and you don't need to go to arbitration or say, oh, the contract's bad, and so-and-so, now i got to hire some mercenaries to, to take my pound of flesh out of you. Instead, I could say, I'm going to sell my future time. So I'm going to double down on the bet. So if I promise that you give me X amount of pat bucks and I'm going to go harvest some asteroids and you fail to do so, you're going to say double or nothing. You know, you're going to, you're going to double, you're going to, you're going to try and change the terms of the repayment. And I'm more likely to say yes, because it's an infinite capacity of options out there. I just need you out there, go hunting it and finding it. Sure. You won't pay me now, but now I can think in terms of hundred year scales or 20 or 200 year scales, because look at all the fucking availability that's available up there. So instead of these usurious assholes uh, playing their financial capitalism game here um, and being real strict dicks about it, it doesn't, once you open up the, the, the promise of space, I mean, there's enough for everybody for a long damn time. And you'll find that the financial capitalists kind of like it that way. 
Yeah, okay. I've been here laughing the entire time. Thank you for explaining that entire thing. <laughs> so far. Happy to help. Okay, uh, a beer church. You had a question. If you can unmute yourself. I will unmute you. You're unmutable. Okay, I, I will. I will. I'll read. <laughs> I'll read his questions on behalf. Um, what happens if someone goes full Sherman? That is destroys the means of production. Then we go full wipe out your genome. That simple. You want to go target humans? We will wipe out your genome from the planet. Anyone who looks like you, just gone. Your family, gone. Banks, gone. Your agreements, gone. Everything, tossed. Because you just broke the severe rule. You broke the human versus robot rule. And you can't break that. Because we're not looking for body count. We're not Malthusians. We're not out here trying to slaughter people because we care more about trees. It's not what we're about. Cool. Benjamin, you had a question. Right, I did. Thank you, Pat. Really appreciate the uh, time and the insight here. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not somebody who was able to read Tragedy and Hope myself, so I'm glad there's people <laughs> like you out there. Um, <laughs> I tried, I tried. I'm into the Tragedy and Hope community. I'm sure you know Grove's work and all these things. I'm in the uh, autonomy class as well as this. Um, okay, so my question was uh, for the robots, do you envision this being uh, autonomously controlled robots or do you envision them being controlled in real time makes more sense because the robots are not yet there in terms of being able to navigate spatial reality. Yep. And that could be a really compelling game for a lot of people who uh, like that notion. Very interesting, man. Really a lot of thought provoking stuff here. Yeah. Appreciate lot, man. Appreciate that. It. What's the time scale for this in your, uh, in your S <laughs> if you could just throw out a guess. I started this research in 2014. Um, I am already talking with people to start rolling out some of this stuff by 2025 so heard yeah i'd love to take the time to uh, get a chance to chat later on i will hit you up so yeah, definitely really, Thanks, really, really appreciate it cool yeah yeah and just to follow up um for clarification the, um i'm not looking at autonomous i'm not looking at um ai's doing all the work and we just kind of sit back and, and laugh at the video game playing before us this is a full participate this is a full participatory so, uh, sport you're going to pilot these things you're going to learn to pilot more and more as time goes on um because i can't trust ai i mean you see the self-driving cars i know they're they're sold sexy wise but i know how they work i just did a whole thing about how neural networks work and how to hack those so uh, I'm not putting my faith in that stuff. I'll trust a human brain. I got some Neanderthal brains on the side, but they're not ready yet. So in the <laughs> meantime, I need, I need human brains. I need people to, they're already playing, spending 10,000 hours playing video games. They're already ready for this economy. I just need to plug them in. Fast reaction times are what we need. <laughs> yeah, some Twitch soldiers. <laughs> right. Cool, cool. Right, we're training them now, yeah. That's right. Thank you. Every time Pat mentions Neanderthal brains, I get a, a meta boner. So, uh, <laughs> Why am I laughing every time I drink this <laughs> I'll try to time it better next time. Uh, um, so yeah, just uh, usually these, uh, a lot of our meetings at the store go for 60 minutes, but these ones usually go 90 minutes. So Pat, you're cool for another 15, 30 minutes here? Sure, of course. <laughs> okay. uh, and John, you had a, a question for Anyan, um, if you can unmute yourself. It's Anshin. Anshin, uh, okay, cool. Hey, Pat, this was incredible. I look forward the entire week for Pat Ryan starts to it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I, depression at the end of the week is the best way to get into the week. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, of your assumptions, I'm interested about the employment assumption. In the case, they prove to be vastly over-optimistic by a magnitude or whatever you want to say. How do you think your model changes and the story changes? Yeah, yeah, there's a uh, error correction should be built in. So if you're going to, well, not if, you, you will hit this saturation where the maximum amount of people will be paired up with the maximum amount of robots. There is whatever the equation represents that, I don't know, but it does exist somewhere. When that happens, you're going to have what Marx called surplus humans. Now, if you time this correctly, and it's really a question of timing, because the unemployment cycle lasts so long in the middle of a technological shift, where you make the move from one tech and then there's an unemployment downturn, there's a disruption, there's a crisis of capital, all these things play out and we've seen this play out since forever. Um, if you time this correctly, 
then what will happen is when you hit that saturation point, by the time the unemployment becomes destabilizing, astroeconomics will have already begun. So that's the key. That's the hedge where you can, as these sociopaths and these psychopaths are just whacking it out on each other, that probably was not the right phrase, but as they are just whacking each other left, right, um, then the Malthusians will disagree with me. They'll say, just kill people if, they, if, if you're wrong about your model. And they'll, they'll point to the steel cycle and they say, well, just, you know, let 14 million people march into the, into the jaws of, of Moloch and stuff like that. And that will give them credibility during this time period. And people will look at them and say, yes, we should do what they're saying, uh, which is why the timing issue is so important. Can I get the timing issue right? No. Can I find people who can get the timing issue right? Probably. So that's the best I got. Um, because if you don't get it right, then what will happen is you're looking at a lot of unemployment who will have the opportunity to command labor. That's where things get interesting. So it's not like right now there's a lot of unemployed people who can command these things. They should be programmers, right? But programming's hard. But if you make the interface easy enough to where I'm just talking to this robot and I say, hey, robot, build this thing, the same way I'm talking to you to do it. So you're going to look at these unemployed people who are going to have their bar to entry to productivity to be almost nothing. So whether that helps public employment or private employment, I'm not sure. But also keep in mind that a lot of my model assumes public employment, which means you do end up in this type of like tribute redistribution system when you have massive amounts of robots extracting minerals in a way that were previously too expensive. So you have a huge volume of minerals. I mean, even if you were to take one asteroid, uh, platinum, and slam it into the moon and then extract it from there, you're looking at platinum prices being the same as zinc and with just one asteroid. So prices will drop gradually, not instantly. I'm, not, I'm never promoting instantaneous stuff here. I'm, I'm very realist about that. And you're looking at the unemployed having access to slave labor. I don't think that's ever happened in human history. So I really don't know what will happen because that's never been an option. Cool. Uh, if I could ask a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. Um, let's say also on the timing, things end up taking longer than you expect. Do you ever, I don't know how to ask this. What if the entire kind of jobs, capitalism-based system morphs into a UBI, blah, blah, blah type system? How do you think that also works with your model here? You'll be able to see rationale for UBI in what I'm proposing by saying, well, we have robot slaves, so let them do all the work, and then we'll just profit from it. That's going to be very politically tempting. You're going to see a lot of people running on that. It's going to be almost boring the amount of people that will run on that. Um, and they'll be able to make it happen to a degree. But what that does to the human psyche, well, we know what that does to the human psyche because the Romans had access to slaves. They had a, the Roman citizens in the city proper had the equivalent of UBI. They didn't have to pay taxes. They had free grain. They had all this stuff that were available to them, and they just spent all day fucking each other. So, so it's it's like this isn't the first time we've done this type of thing. Um, if you want to see what UBI really looks like, go to Saudi Arabia. Good lord, the KSA. You get a royalty for being alive if you're a Saudi citizen. Like, oh, you're born. Here's your free money. Like, I'm not even making that up. They will they will pay you to be a they will pay for your entire school from like pre-K to like master's thesis. Like we, there are examples of like this, like, like this leisure utopia that, that, that America in particular seems to always strive for. Uh, they pop up from so often from time to time in history. So it's, it's not like we'd be the first to do it. There are models we can pull from. And at some point I will most likely have to pull from those models to understand how to, how to manage those a bit better. Cool. Okay, I'm going to read this question. Uh, the robot wars will be dependent on a lot of computing power. Computing power currently has a lot of resource bottleneck with Colton. What's the future of the Congo in this context? Will there be a fight to control this country? Computing power can be mitigated. Yes, so let me answer the spirit of the question first. Um, you will have a lot of these robot resources being deployed for strategic capture 
um, for, of those resources. That will be an imperative. Uh, and a lot of conflict will certainly arise from there. The computational power that's required, again, because I'm not using AI, and there's a, um, there's a analog to why you don't want to use AI. Uh, it's uh, the same thing as a rocket ship, where in order to get my rocket ship out of orbit, I need fuel, but that adds more weight. So now I need more fuel to add more weight. And now I need more fuel to compensate for the weight of the fuel. And before you know it, your, your ship doesn't go anywhere. So there's that, actually this strange balance in order to get a ship off the planet and into orbit. And the same thing's true about robots that are using AI. The computational complexity means more hardware, more battery, but the battery means more weight. More weight means more structural mass, and now I need more battery to compensate for the more CPU, and then round and round we go. So at some point, you don't want to use AIs until they really go through like a graphene revolution or something at the transistor level. And I'm not going to wait around for that. There's no need to. So the cheap hack is to basically have IoT, where the, the machine has its bare minimum sensors for balance and stability and control, but it's the human brain that's doing a lot of the offloading and off processing, just for starters. Then that will obviously put a huge pressure on trying to create these low energy AI stuff. And if you remember the morality machine, I go into the energy efficiency stuff there. The, creating that economy of pressure, IoT is gonna do that with or without robotic nationalism. That's just on the, on the slate anyway. So, you may have resource conflicts, but those are, those are accounting problems where you say, is the conflict worth it? Do I deploy soldiers here? And what's the opportunity cost of that? My robot soldiers here versus putting R&D into things like 3D graphene or, or, or cadmium arsenide or something like that. So those are the equations you make to actually answer those questions in a more predictable manner. David, you had a question for Pat. Yeah, this is this is kind of jumping, trying to trying to jump out as far as I can think. So, listening to Verveke and really grokking the levels of knowing. So, for those who don't know, Verveke lecture series, Awakening from the Meaning the Crisis, important, but biological life seems to go participatory, booting up into perspectival knowing booting up into procedural knowing and then booting up into that into propositional propositional seems like the peak of the pyramid to us and so when we start inventing computing we think ai is going to be the end all be all because we could teach it to play chess but we can't teach it language or vision and that's really hard yeah. so it seems that biological or synthetic life goes the other direction. It's propositional, it's its base, and then it goes the other direction with participatory being its final stage. So there's something like a flipping of the motivation, which is kind of the Lorenz attractor kind of lobe switch between right brain, left brain, left brain, right brain, you know, which, which is dominant, that kind of balances where we are, that creates kind of an ever increasing pendulum swing to new dominance hierarchies. So is there something like that that is continuing to grow us with balancing the, the AI? So AI stretches us to grow more and we stretch it to grow more rather than some final end state. Yes, yes, that is, um, that is a pretty good visual. Lorenz attractor stuff is applicable in this sense, which is why I focused on the Neanderthal brains. I, um, I did not have faith when I started, do, when I really started researching the AI tech in 2005, I had absolutely no faith it was going to hit any of its promises, because it's an it's an epistemological problem from the very jump. It just demands infinite data and infinite computation to solve infinitely useless things. So it, the the unless you structure your entire economy to have infinitely cheap power, you know, Tesla hope aside, you're not going to hit those AI goals. Yeah, not a hot dog. Exactly. Not a hot dog. I don't know if you've ever seen that from Silicon Valley, but that's exactly the problem. So instead of trying to pretend that in our mathematical hubris, we can reproduce um, a two billion year winner take all product that is the brain uh, in a 55 year post industrial span, I have just given up on that fight entirely. And I said, screw it. Let's just use brains. They can't use human brains, obviously. So I use another species instead. And, and so here's a, here's a thought. This is kind of where this comes from is um, 
back in 2005, watching Kurzweil talk about the age of spiritual machines and the thought that technology can evolve faster than we can because it goes exponential and we can't do that. My thought was, oh, you're underestimating the power of networked brains doing something kind of very powerful kind of um, computational thing. If yep. each human is effectively a neuron and a global brain doing all that kind of computation, we have, we have way more computational power right. at, our, at our disposal. That's right. That so requires I've... some sort of level of coordination that needs us to use the technological brain to extend that. But something happens where each of our, where basically Indra's net becomes self-aware. Mm. So self-aware is a, uh, I don't, I don't burden myself with theological problems. Um, but the, uh, um, when it comes to that level of exponential expectation, you'll find that in fractal complexity. You don't necessarily have to drive more horsepower behind something. Once your network effects go fractal, then you have all those resources totally at your availability. And uh, that's what I'd like to rely on. But in, instead, of, um, instead of putting all the trust in the eggheads in, in Silicon Valley, I'm just going to trust 2 billion years of evolution, which already has the fractal complexity built into it. It's already there. Um, so I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, that's just overall silly. And when you start tapping into, like, again, even with humans, you, with humans controlling swarms of AI, which is a huge part of military research right now, it's not as intuitive as like a real-time strategy game. It's not like StarCraft where I select the drones and then off you go. Um, they're experimenting with some pretty clever stuff in terms of neural interfacing. How do I control like uh, a pile of people? Uh, how do I control a pile of drones just from like sub, sub auditory, you know, thoughts in the nerve down here? There's, I've seen a couple interesting proposals that involve um, putting a mesh on your tongue and using the tongue to, because the tongue has so many sensor receptors on it and using the sensations of that to control uh, all these drone swarms. So, so you're looking at full spectrum neural envelopment in order to control all of these types of things. It's not just typing on a keyboard or selecting with a mouse. It's every single part of your neurolog neurology being tapped, to, tapped into wherever it can. So I think you're going to see that type of control scheme rise as the economic pressures to command robotic labor rise with it. If I could just do one quick follow-up, the, the sense of, somebody said the, oh, the Borg, right? It's the Borg time. There's something here that doesn't quite gel in my mind with the Borg. Um, in that if I, if I look at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the Matrix trilogy as an interesting view in which, you know, the third Matrix is really confusing when you first watch it. But when Neo gets blinded and he sees that it's all light, the machines are light too. Mm -hmm. It's something like intelligence or life comes at it from all angles. So this consciousness thing, I don't want to say, you know, this the, it's the part that you don't want to go into. It's already there. So this is something like, and, and this is where I, I come back to Donald Hoffman and the notion of the case against reality. Something is already happening where life, the universe is living and just doing ever more complex ways of perceiving itself. So the thought that we invented something, it's really, we're being used yeah. to deepen a perspective, not to, not to invent a perspective. There's, um, there's a raging debate in academia about is mathematics invented or is it discovered? And that hits the heart of what it is you're talking about. And that and you can actually filter a personality pretty quickly from that and be like, if it's, if it's discovered, uh, then you're probably talking to an engineer. And if it's invented, you're probably talking to a philosopher. So it's a, it's a fun little, or a theologian. So it's a fun little game. Um, but it, that's another way of sort of mathematically teasing out what I think you're circling. And I think next week I'll be, I'll be covering auto cults, which will be tapping into the periphery of some of that stuff. Certainly not the core, but definitely the periphery. Cool. Thanks for that, David. So let's ask one more question. And uh, Hannah, if you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi. Let me just scroll up because that last one wasn't a question. Um, 
I can't find my question anymore. I would like to volunteer my space to someone else. I can read your question, Hannah. Uh, we've seen human operators at a, of at distant war tech in need of mental health support with things like drones. With the human propensity of anthropomorphization, will the robot soldier operators need therapy? That is, I've seen, I've met some of those drone pilots. Some of them are hurt by it. Some of them enjoy the fact that they're God. It's, uh, it's, most people can't comprehend, like, it's not like they're sitting there and disassociating from it and saying, it's just pixels on a screen. No drone operator's doing that. They know damn well that they're hitting some people and that's going to have consequences and they hope that their kill chain did the right analysis because they're just there pressing buttons. They're not there making, you know, the call on who, you know, what wedding party to target. Um, and what gets even worse is that sometimes the operators are in control and sometimes it's experimentation on AI. So if you start seeing these drones targeting wedding parties, it's because those were false positives for groups, according to the AI. Oops, you know, they put AI in the kill chain and it makes mistakes. They don't talk about that, but that's a thing. And so if that ever gets back down to the operator, then that guy's like, what the fuck? I didn't want to do that. Obviously he didn't want to do that. And he's not out there for a genocidal rampage. Um, so there is huge pressure to at least psychological to one keep your operator in check um, but that's again that's targeting humans what does an operator look like when he's blowing up robots think he cares probably no different than shooting you know pixels on a screen targeting humans is, is a big deal targeting other robots yeah whatever just light it up all right on that note, Pat, do you have any final thoughts to end today's session? My analysis relies on a lot of assumptions and there is an endless number. Uh, every single, you might have seen the political compass and every single square in the political compass can tear this to shreds. Um, mm -hmm. There is no, no doubt about that. Um, and I'm not here to make an indefensible, unassailable position. I'm basically making a heuristic guess of when you get information technology to the cheap state that it's at, and you compare that with the demand for increasing cheap labor, it is not hard to start getting these robot soldiers and robot warrior, uh, robot labor. Once you have that in play, do you think it's gonna be democracy? Do you think it's gonna be fascism? Do you think it's gonna be something you've never fucking seen before? It's hmm. probably gonna be the latter. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. <laughs> so next week, uh, Pat back, same time, uh, same channel, um, continue uh, the conversation and the explorations here at the Dark Stoa. So a few announcements before we close out. Uh, next week, um, I'm going to upload uh, or post a lot of events on the Stoa page. Uh, we do have a symposium, our first symposium that's coming uh, on Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be called Let Us, Not, or Let Us Maybe Get Triggered by Jordan Peterson Symposium. <laughs> <laughs> There's a series of uh, talks from all sorts of the spectrum, political spectrum on Jordan Peterson. It's going to end off uh, with a screening on the, the rise of Jordan Peterson documentary with the filmmakers in attendance. And then we're going to have a Cure of the Dawn um, kind of like jam. And he might introduce Steal the Culture theme song of the Stoa, which John Reiki, uh, uh talked about. So that's going to be dope. Uh, I'm going to post that now. Check it out. Sign up the mailing list. Check out the gift economy. And... Uh, and if you have any existential horror uh, emerge from this, uh, just let me know and we'll, we'll plug you into the wisdom gym. <laughs> and hopefully things will go okay. All right, everyone. Thank you. Good night. See you, folks.